You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. I think it's funny, like over the years I've been asked a lot, what's your pain at now? Like on a 10, give me it. And I'm like, you know, eight. But uh, they're like, it's not an eight because you're just still talking and you're still standing and you're conscious. So it's not at an eight. And I'm like, okay, well, you tell me what my pain's at then. Yeah. Like, don't ask me a question. Right. Because how am I like, okay, it's fucking bad, but I'm okay. So whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Pain's funny. It's so subjective, right? Yeah. Like you have those people that it's like, you know, they trip and it's a 10 out of 10. Like they want to put a bullet in their head. And then, like you said, like you've treated people with a torn quad. Like I had a pinched nerve and I was on fire, like loading plates for a guy. And he's like, oh, I'm just really tired today, man. I don't think I have it. Right. And then I load like 225 kilos on my back and squat it the next day after driving 10 hours. It's like, why don't you just shut up? But do you think it just changes that though? Like, do you think people change like every time they come in and like they do something past like they're a long way away from being hard as nails? Yeah. But, like. Or do people just in their comfortable lives circle back to the same relative default of like, this is my threshold? I think it's like, I think it's like anything, right? It's like frequency over volume. Like some people go through a hard time once and it's like a week later, they forget they went through a hard time, right? But it's like people have shit lives every day, seem to build up a tolerance to it. So I think it's one of those things, like I think people have to be exposed to like constant micro doses of stress. I don't think it's like one maximal event. Yeah. Well, it's weird because like, I mean, you kind of look at like neuroplasticity and how the brain actually changes through stressful events. Like yeah. you don't actually see your epigenetic expression unless you're stressed, but it's like a, a macro dose of stress. I mean, that breaks the system altogether, right? Like any, yeah. if you haven't met anyone with PTSD, that's basically what that is. Yeah, it's yeah. one right? massive. But then you Joel. see people who are just like, oh, you know, oh, wait, what was your childhood like? Oh, it wasn't belt or wooden spoon? Weird. But they just got that every day. Every, yeah, exactly, yeah, right? And, like, and that becomes the status quo. Yeah. That's like the way I compare it is growing up in Windsor. Like whenever I travel anywhere, even shitty places, it's like, oh, this is amazing. This like, is not Windsor. This is south side <laughs> right. of Chicago? Is this is Chirac? It's like, where's your Drulard Road? Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah. No, this is this. Like, look at the nice buildings you have. And this river that doesn't have dead bodies and alligators in it <laughs> somehow. But when did you kind of realize that like, like, when was the perspective for you that, oh, okay, maybe I'm not actually complaining? After my heart surgery, I think, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, almost two years now. Well, even a lot of my friends, they noticed that too. Because for years, I didn't want to talk about anything with a lot of people. Because it's like, stop feeling sorry for me because I'm fine. Right. And then it's kind of like, okay, well, people started shifting that to, holy shit, that's inspiring. So, like, can you share more of that? So then I'm like, yeah, okay. Like, it's not... It's no skin off my back to share my story, but I don't want to complain because I don't, I don't feel like I want to complain. Right. So it's kind of that shift for me where it's not complaining. It's like sharing and trying to like motivate if you want to call it that. So I mean, let's, let's, let's reverse engineer from the heart surgery and like work yeah. our way back in some reverse Benjamin Button right. esque tale. <laughs> well, just to start from the start. So I have a rare genetic mutation it's called homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia yeah just spell that real quick <laughs> yeah i think that's a triple yeah. word school. so it's a uh, 27 letters i believe if i remember i did a, a science project on it in public school <laughs> shout out canadian education yeah. system fuck yeah it's it was the largest piece of bristleboard <laughs> in the class so basically my body doesn't remove cholesterol from my bloodstream so it's constantly recirculating so that just leads to a lot of fucking problems so I got diagnosed, I had xanthomas on my knuckles, which is cholesterol deposits in the skin. So if you can kind of see, my, my knuckles are kind of a weird color. Yeah. They used to be bright orange, like orange peel color. So all of my knuckles and my joints had these orange spots on them. So when I was 15 months old, my parents saw these little stripes. And my sister is a year older than me. So they're like, okay, she probably just colored on with a Crayola. <laughs> Classic. Very Jeez. detailed. Right? Didn't miss a single joint. Yeah, well, no, it was only a couple of them at the time, but then they didn't go away, so we got diagnosed and 
tissue samples and this kind of thing. And they realized that I, I have this condition. So 17 months old, I got a central line, started on plasmapheresis, which is the treatment that basically removes plasma from the bloodstream, which is where cholesterol is circulated. And uh, I started going to Toronto Sick Kids Hospital once every two weeks for this treatment. So I did that all my childhood. And then when I was eight, I had a triple bypass the day after my birthday. Had what? What did you get for your eighth birthday? Yeah. Yeah, the truck. Yeah. <laughs> the truck. Tonka truck. <laughs> Woo. I might have too. I, I had a party in the uh, like the room, you know, in Sick Kids. hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I brought the chainsaw in. Yeah. So they threw me a party and shit, but that was my eighth birthday. And I was the youngest kid in North America at the time to have a triple bypass. At so. the time, has that record been broken? I don't know. I was in 1994, so. You gotta look into that. Yeah. If they have, hey, I Jamie, look this up. Yeah. Me. yeah. <laughs> but so that was kind of the first chunk of my life. And I didn't really miss a beat. You know, I recovered. I went to school in the fall. Okay. Hold on. Language there. You had a triple bypass. You missed a few beats. Okay. That's yeah. a heart attack. I've missed a couple of beats in my life. Yeah. <laughs> So that's kind of like one, my major condition or whatever. And then the next year I got diagnosed with superior vena cava syndrome. So that's why my face turns purple and I don't have any blood flowing down from my head. So the superior vena cava is kind of like your main drain. I don't have any of that. So that's a problem. <laughs> that's an yeah. issue. Yeah. So wait, you have an inability to, to process cholesterol. Yeah. And you have an inability to drain blood from your head. Is that like a bad combination? Like, obviously, I think I know the answer, yeah. but like that is that's a shit perfect storm. It's not particularly ideal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, luckily, like I went in for surgery. So, what they can do? So, kind of how I describe it. If you imagine your superior vena cava is like this tube, mine's filled with play doh, right? And so they went in to put this straw through the play doh so I can get blood back flowing, right? So I went in for the surgery, but the blockage was too it was too tall and it was up too high on my neck. So this the stent they were gonna put in would prevent me from moving my head. So obviously they can't put that in there. So I went in for the surgery, they sewed me up, I woke up, they're like, sorry about your luck, we can't help you. <laughs> oh my god. So hey, chick stick scars. Good luck out there. Uh, yeah, so if you look at me, I, was, <laughs> I wish it was more true. <laughs> but uh, so anyways, that was when I was nine. So since then. Oh, he was nine. Yeah, oh, that I was this was a after. couple of years ago. I got my what bypass the, uh, when I was eight. And then the next summer I had this SVC because I got whooping cough and was in the hospital for five weeks. And then <laughs> I got diagnosed with this other shit. So it was a rough couple of years. And, At what point uh, in the story do you get hit by lightning and run yeah. over? Like? <laughs> I mean, it might have been a better story, actually. I know. This one's on a pretty good track, man. We're at yeah. nine. We've yeah. already lived and died three times. Yeah. So... Honestly, after that, it was pretty easy. Like, I <laughs> I wasn't able to play sports as a kid, but, like, I, people imagine my life as being this hard thing. But I had a great family. I had a great upbringing. And I lived in a small town, so it was safe and fun. You know, I went fishing literally every summer. My dad's the biggest fisherman you're ever going to meet. So we got fish and tackle for our second birthdays. We started shooting archery for our third birthdays. Like, kind of missed a few there eight and nine were a little rough but you know but yeah, yeah I, mean, I didn't perceive that i was missing anything because i was doing all this other stuff so i couldn't play sports because i had this plastic tube in my chest and i couldn't get contacted it couldn't get pulled out obviously but i didn't i didn't feel like i wasn't doing things i just i couldn't swim because my chest had to stay dry simple i don't you care you can't swim anyway yeah, yeah neither can i so right on same same yeah i can swim but then moving out past nine, yeah. it's like, you're not out of the fucking woods. No, so kind of after that, my body adapted. So luckily for me, I grew venous collaterals in my upper body, my upper chest, and my neck to allow the blood to flow down from my head. So, because a lot of the times when patients get superior vena cava syndrome, you have brain hemorrhaging and stroke, right? Blood goes up to your head, things go pop, yeah. and you're fucked. Uh, but luckily, that didn't happen to me. So I had a lot of time from nine till really 30, but nine till 20 roughly, where my body just adapted and I kept going. So I was lucky, I really was. I think that's the perspective shift. And sure. then do you, have a, do you have a pacemaker? No. So if you hear a click right now, I don't know if it's picking up on the mic, but I have two mechanical valves in my heart. Oh, that's what it is. And okay. four bypass grafts, so. And is that all from when you were eight? No, so the three from when I was eight, and then f for my 32nd birthday, so going you know, back. Partridge in a pear tree. Like, yeah. What the fuck do they bring you now? 
that was my uh so i had a bentol procedure which is basically ascending aorta aortic root and aortic valve is all replaced with a synthetic piece and then my mitral valve was replaced and a fourth bypass graft was put on so was that like not elective but was that something that was like okay on thursday i'm going to go in for this or like okay what stop what you're doing right now we're going in for this so it should have been the second one yeah it was um i was hospitalized the end of august 2017 i was told i had about eight to 12 weeks to live so i had to go in for heart surgery like immediately i went for pre-surgery november 21st and then I didn't hear from the hospital for six more months. So <laughs> I went May 25th, 2018. So that was September till May, where it's just kind of in limbo. Like, you're going to drop dead. You need heart surgery. So hopefully you make it that long. And that was kind of like a big shift for me in my life, for sure. But like, what was your shelf life before that? Like, the, uh, the guy with the triple bypass yeah. is pretty good. going to really? Yeah, I, I mean... You're as long marked as, for a century. You could go a hundred when you get a triple bypass at eight. I mean, in all likelihood, no, but right. I didn't have any active problems because I, I go for yearly check-ins with my cardiologist. I get ECGs and echoes. And then I do every couple of years, I get a stress test. And every other couple of years, I get an angiogram and they just check in the condition of things. So over my twenties, everything was pretty good. And nothing was imminent. Yep. Everything Until was when? stable. That's why I started. Well, I've been lifting weights since I was about fifteen, but mid twenties I started powerlifting because I thought, obviously, I want to powerlift <laughs> for, for hell, right? Yeah, for the yeah, hell, because <laughs> for the culture. Because yeah. my blood pressure probably isn't high enough. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna, gonna, gonna hold my breath rep. with five hundred pounds on my. Back. <laughs> well, the the plus side is when I go to powerlifting meets, people just assume I'm a guy on a lot of D ball because my face is purple as fuck. Like, if you go, <laughs> give me a high five. <laughs> You've got Lily Bridge We're red, brothers, and right. then you've got Muscle Bill purple. Yeah, <laughs> you can literally. I think I saw that at Home Hardware. It's a paint swatch. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm doing my next bathroom that yeah. color. Beautiful. I'm famous. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. So when was it? When it was imminent? When? It, when did you get like the, the 2017? Have... Yeah, September 2017. I got the surgeon came in after I had two weeks of testing, and basically said, uh, "So my aortic valve was pretty much closed right off, so I didn't have." hardly any blood getting out of my heart right. so for those of you at home you need that yeah carry on it's so what I, the way i describe it your aortic valve is basically the exit door on your heart so if no blood's coming out of there your body doesn't have blood so and, and inversely the pressure on the inside of that valve was so high that any time that my heart pumped that valve's gonna blow off so that was the danger i was in <laughs> like a saloon door like yeah. just yeah. kicking it in <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like a manhole so that was basically or... my nine months from September till May of any time now, something's going to happen. No, that two weeks of testing, like, are you mm -hmm. sitting there waiting for that door to swing open? Do you kind of know shit's not right? Like, I know when I do really yeah. bad at a test. Like, I leave that going exam. Hey, what did you put for number 23? For sure. Ah, fuck, I got that wrong. After two weeks of testing in the hospital, you got to be like, okay, the more tests they do. <laughs> the worse this has got to yeah, be. Yeah, that conversation's yeah. not going to be easy. I mean... I knew it was coming, like for basically my whole life, I knew I'd need another heart surgery at some point. Right. But we kind of theorized because my heart was stable for so long that it was going to be, you know, five years, seven years, some kind of length of time. We right. didn't know. Right. But everything was good. So we just kept going until the next year. But then things just weren't good. So I, I almost blacked out in the parking lot in August 2017. And that was kind of the big like, holy fuck, I need to go to the hospital because that's not a good thing. Just so. out of the clear blue sky, like just walking through the parking lot one day and then. Yeah. So I, I went from work to good life in Kingston, got out of my car and yeah, I, I almost hit the ground. So the world went black. I grabbed my car and I kind of hung on and uh, just kind of told myself, don't pass out. So I was. So then like the door swings open, two weeks of testing, surgeon walks in. Yep. Says you, get, you need surgery. You get the death sentence. Yep. What do you do? I went home, went to the gym. <laughs> this is it. Just, just yeah. say la vie. Just like you didn't go to yeah. Disneyland. No. You didn't blow it up your nose. No. <laughs> Slight hesitation. But yeah. Well, like, <laughs> No. He basically, I had two options. He said, basically, we can leave it untreated and you have some amount of time until your valve does separate or we go for surgery and you might survive. So to me, there's no option. I'm like, okay, well, clearly I'll go for heart surgery. But- 
So because of the venous collaterals in my chest from my superior vein and cava syndrome diagnosed when I was nine, I have so many veins in my upper body that cutting my chest open to access my heart to operate was a pretty good chance that it was going to kill me. So be, for so a couple of reasons, because one, for bleeding out. So when you cut the chest, you cut through this forest of veins, you need to mitigate the bleeding there, right? And then secondarily to that, as soon as they cut through those veins, I lose all the blood access or the draining coming down from my head, right? So instantaneously, I could just have a stroke and die, right? So I need heart surgery, but accessing my heart could kill me and not going for heart surgery, I'm definitely going to die. So to me, there was no option. It's like, okay, we'll book me in and let's go. Yeah. And then it just took longer than it needed to. I don't know about you guys. My lower back's kind of sore. Yeah, fuck off. <laughs> so, like, I mean, yeah. when when lies the inevitable existential crisis? Like, you're 30 years old. Like, at some point, you got to think you got gypped or dealt a shit hand. Because I'm listening. No. Why? How? I've always... The way I've always seen it is I'm, I've been happy that it's been me and not my family. Like, it's not my brother. It's not my sister. It's not my parents. I'm the guy in the hospital. And it's, I think of it as progressive overload, really. Like, I've spent my whole life getting these situations and circumstances put, presented to me. And then I just continue to get through them. And so I'm used to it. And it's not a surprise. Like, I, I was expecting another open heart surgery sometime. And I just found out, okay, now's the time. So, okay, it was like an easy thing to accept, but I find that most people, like say with cancer or anything, really, you wake up one day, you get a diagnosis and you have this whole paradigm shift in your life. Like everything's taken away. Like I'm going to go from having a hundred year lifespan to I've got cancer. Now I might die next month. But in my mind, that's always the case for everybody. Like we're all terminal. So who gives a fuck? Right. It's, it's reality. Yeah, but I guess my if you were to get like flip the sh- like flip the script, put yourself in a situation where you're gonna get like you have a clean slate, and then mm. thirty you get the terminal diagnosis. Do you think you'd be as apt to handle it? How do you think you would have reacted to like being totally you know your eighth yeah. birthday was Chuck E. Cheese's, <laughs> your ninth birthday was Canada's Wonderland, sure. your thirtieth birthday was terminal. Do you think you could have handled it the same way? No, absolutely not. No, no, I think I'd be like everybody I've always met, for sure. Because I, I've spent a lot of time in the hospital and I've met a lot of people who are going through really hard things and I see it like they, they don't know what the fuck to do. Yeah. Right. Cause how would you, if you know, if the worst thing that happens is Skippy dies when you're seven, you know, the, the family pet, and then you wake up at 35 and you know, brain tumor. Right. That's, that's a big jump. Right. But if you have this and this and this and this, and then, okay. Second heart surgery. Yeah. It's, it's not a far jump to just, come to that conclusion so is a lot of the ease once you ease like deal with this come from the fact that you've just been exposed to people who had it worse like that absolutely what, i think so yeah like that like being in that environment where like you get to leave yeah and honestly that's in the last couple of years it's been a big shift for me i go to the hospital once a week now i have been going since i was eight so after my triple bypass i started going weekly to the hospital for this treatment but when i leave the hospital now like I just walk out and I take a big breath of fresh air every time. Rain or sign, like the winter time doesn't matter. I go outside and I'm like, this is a reset. And now I get another week to do whatever the fuck I want because I just left the hospital. Next week I'm coming back, but I have all this time. So it doesn't really matter how shitty the week's been. Since my heart surgery now, it's especially prevalent in my mind that when I'm leaving, I just, I get to live life now. How long were you in for when you had the heart surgery? About 10, I think 11 days maybe. Okay. Yeah. And now any time during like the recovery, was it not clear that you were going to leave? Not in my mind. No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If, I'm kind of in a gray zone because they don't really know what the fuck's going on. You know, they, there's no case uh, that's been presented with the same circumstances as me. So they don't really have a, a good way to kind of forecast what's coming. Yeah. So in my mind, if I'm, if I'm in the hospital, if I'm not going home today, I'll go home tomorrow. If I'm not going home tomorrow, I'll go home the next day. Because one of these days, it'll be progressed to a point where they just discharge me. So that's a, I don't really know how that shift happened, but I don't really ever find myself thinking, I'm never going home. Now, and like, 
you know, the, the weekly breath of fresh air, I mm-hmm. guess what else has changed since the surgery? Like other than just leaving in the hospital every week with like a little bit of a frame shift, how has that experience changed like the day to day? That's a good question. My, well, before I was working for the most part, two jobs, so 60 to 85 hours a week. And now I'm working part time and I'm on disability. So that's a big difference day to day. In my, so I had, a, I had a hard time letting go. And I don't know if that's, you know, ego or if it's kind of North American culture, but not working. It's, it's a hard mental shift to be like, I'm not being lazy right now. I have a health problem. Right. But then it's like, well, that's an excuse because I've done it my whole life. So, so it's this weird kind of circular, I don't know, thought process that I've had to kind of break out of to just kind of accept. So now I'm like 33 and partially retired. Which is basically that's what the, I said. That's like dream. Right. right. I have four years to go. <laughs> but no, I get that, yeah. like, you know, this idea. Like, there's, cause there's meaning tied in it. Like, whatever you do, like, even if you have a, like a shit job, people who do shit jobs well are usually pretty happy. Absolutely. Right? They're more happy, like, right? Like, yeah. the lower the, the income, usually the happier you are with your performance at your job. Yeah. I mean, there's less risk, there's less stress. But you can see people who do shit jobs shittily, and you're just like, you're just a, you're miserable. Right? Yeah. Why yeah. are you here? Yeah, like the the guy yeah. who burns your bacon at the diner at seven a.m. on a weekend is like, dude, it's not that hard. Yeah. You're just not trying. But like, there's no meaning to that. And also, why do you hate it so much? Like, how bad is the rest of your life that you have to hate cooking bacon? Right. Well, I mean, what if it ruins your shirt, like Mr. Bernacchi? <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> That's just ruined your day. No, yeah. but it's just like that could be a hard thing to step away from. Like, there's a certain cultural expectation of yeah, that you like, have to give back to society and, in yeah, some way. Bread. Yeah. Um, I guess I have a question. It's like. Like we said, like like Shallow said, like if you didn't get like a terminal diagnosis or like any health problems till we were thirty, would you deal with it different? Would you deal with it uh, differently if they, if you could know how many days you have left? Like just knowing that it's like inevitable. I know this is hard. This yeah. is a shitty question to ask. No, the easy question is you wouldn't fucking be here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Wouldn't I would be though because this is what I love. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. if they gave you like whatever. If they said you had five hundred days, where yeah. you just exist in this like absurdist existential realm of like another week. It's mm-hmm. like what would be easier? What would be harder? Would it be easier to know you have X amount of days or harder? I think it'd be a wash. I'd be a lot less concerned about money for sure. Fair enough. Because, you know, financial situation affects day to day, right? But if yeah. I have, well, I've got 500 days, so fuck it. We're going we're gonna to budget it out and yeah. blow it on the first day. I was just going to say. That's right. So I'm going to have one awesome day and yeah. then 499 <laughs> days where I'm doing nothing. I'm dodging creditors. Yeah. yeah. I call my friends. Hey, can you pick me up? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I still, I would like to travel more than I have, but traveling poses a bit of a problem for me too like i said i I have to go to the hospital once a week and fortunately canadian healthcare is set up how it is so i i can afford to do that um but leaving the country so last summer so about 13 months after my heart surgery i had uh, a blood infection and a tissue infection in my left side so I woke up one day with a fever and 12 hours later i was convulsing in the ambulance on the way to the london hospital and uh that was my heart can't handle this like get out of mechanical valves man it was a big it was honestly that was probably the scariest time in my life um it was the first time i ever kind of accepted that this is going to be the end because i've I've never thought to myself that i can't continue i just i have that kind of ingrained in my mind but i logically realized that my heart can't take this situation for a long amount of time. Yeah. And the drugs that they were giving me in the ambulance didn't make any difference. So I was fully conscious and I was having a conversation with the attendant and I said, you need to get a pen because I need you to write a note to my parents and uh, like do that. Right. And she's like, no, 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 calm down. It's okay. This is going to work out. And I'm like, if this doesn't stop, it's not going to work out. I know that. And that was the first time I ever had that thought of, I'm going to die, depending on when, right? So that was a really hard thing for me to gather after the fact. Um, I was in the ICU for two weeks. IV antibiotics, on oxygen, the whole thing. And got sent home. And I was, like, mentally the, in the probably the hardest place I've been. Uh, I would say, yeah, my whole life. So... It was a weird shift to get out of that. Like, I don't, I don't really know how to explain that. Was, was there a rebound effect? Like, I mean, you read about 
I mean, it's a different context. But like you read about like the German Blitz in London during the war, mm. and it's like the guys who would go into the tunnels and end up walking on the other side of it. They all had that, right? Like mm-hmm. they're pretty well documented in history. Like Absolutely. you obviously think you're going to die if it's raining the hell bombs from the sky. But every time they emerge, like the idea with the German Blitz was it's like we we'll break their spirits, but it actually did the opposite, mm-hmm. right? Like the more, you know, angry, toothless British people were left crawling out of these, you know, semi-bombed tunnels, the more resilient they became. Did you find like on the other side of that, there was like a, there was like a hardening after that? Honestly, it was a message from Jay. So Jay, as you know, he's all about Sisyphus and he's got the Sisyphus systems journaling now and all that. But he messaged me and just reminded me of the Sisyphus story and um, to be grateful for the struggle. And it honestly, it really did change my whole paradigm. Just, I don't know if it's, I mean, over this whole time I was going through a divorce and this, this whole other back burner stuff. So meant to- back burner stuff. All that back burner yeah. stuff. Yeah. All that other really stressful. Yeah. Shit it had about like a year and a half of relationship breakdown, but uh, that's fine. Yeah, but in any case, so I was mentally, it was in a rough spot, and uh, Jay messaged me, and it just, uh, it made me realize that I'm really used to pushing a boulder, and I really do enjoy it, and I find a lot of comfort knowing that I've always been able to keep pushing the boulder up the mountain, so it kind of reminded me that it doesn't matter this, like, how steep the mountain is, or what the terrain's like, if you just dig your feet in and keep pushing, change is guaranteed in life right so it kind of reminded me of that and then everything shifted and got easier again so i suppose to answer your question yeah like i did really shift into a better mindset and it's like okay i have this kind of under control again to whatever degree i ever did which nobody ever does you know but now now what's the boulder i guess like it's weird to have the first chapter of your life closed with a triple bypass and yeah. that not be the end of the book. Yeah. And then as we close yeah. scene two, we come into another heart surgery, still not the end of the book. Now it's like muscle bills back for encore. Yeah. What's the boulder now? Like, I mean, I'm a big fan, like obviously friends with Jay and the site, like the, you know, yeah. you just finished reading the Albert, you read Albert Camus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of his books. Yeah. And this, I, I mean, and if you read like I, one of my favorite books is man's search for meaning and sure. the idea that like, happiness felt through fulfillment and like if you read like the Gita it's all about having purpose and duty behind that culture and it's like what's the rock now like what's the yeah I mean you know a lot of people find being busy and being productive two of the same or one and the same but it's like you know 60 hours a week I've been there like for sure and that's you know I wasn't been there with like 17 pieces of mechanical hardware in my heart but like (laughs) but you you feel a sense of fulfillment when you just your head hits the pillow and you get your four hours of sleep a night exactly but now it's like you've kind of accepted this transition to this new chapter what's what's the boulder so i'm trying to just share my story more and i hate using the term like inspire people or motivate people but it really seems to be what people call it yeah fuck that don't yeah. call, it, call it kicking him in the head tell him to <laughs> shut the fuck up yeah i'd like to open people's eyes to but also i like to be able to start a conversation that is like it doesn't matter what kind of shit you have going on in your life so whether it's you know your heart's fucked or you know god forbid your family dies or whatever like everybody has hard things but everybody can still push the boulder so whatever that boulder is you're not alone and if you need to talk about it with somebody, talk about it. Like if you don't have someone easily accessible in your day-to-day that you trust to the point where you can say, look, and I'm having a really hard time. I need some help. Get rid of the fucking people in your life. Because that's, that's a terrible feeling. When you sit 100%. at home and you feel isolated and alone like so many people do now. Like 2020, depression is insanely high, right? Suicide's always on the rise. Why? We have access to everybody in the whole world through a fucking cell phone and everybody feels alone, but we're not alone. So I'm just trying to, I don't know if you say promote this sense of community, but just a conversation that it's okay to have a hard time with what you're dealing with, whatever that is. And I don't give a fuck what that is. So I hope you don't give a fuck what mine is. Just, you have a problem. I have a problem. We all have problems. So just don't be so mean to the guy that's grumpy cooking your bacon. You know? Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I think it's like it's it's yeah. You you kind of made the link of like you know we have access to everyone in the world, but everyone feels alone. Yeah, I think there's so much negativity circling around social media and it's yeah. mental health. And there's a certain exposure factor. Like 
you know, first off, like, you know, 50 years ago, keeping up with the Joneses was just looking through your kitchen window. Now mm-hmm. keeping up with the Joneses is, well, the Joneses are curating their their life experiences on an app in the palm of your hand. And the Joneses mm-hmm. aren't just next door. Yeah, they're, they're every true. next door. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. But I think there's a flip side of that. Like I've had a lot of people reach out through the podcast, as I'm sure you have with yours, like. And I, I think there's a there's an ancillary benefit to social media or like a silver lining to that connectivity that just goes underutilized. Absolutely. Like for every, you know, you're a Nazi comment on cat videos on YouTube. It's like, all right, there's someone in a DM somewhere is helping someone out. Have you come across a lot of that since you started sharing your story? Uh, definitely some. Uh, so I've done four, I think four or five different, uh, I guess you call them talks or presentations or whatever. And after every one, I've had at least a handful of people, if not more, whether they reach out immediately before they leave or they message me afterwards and they'll just say, you know, thank you is essentially, it's amazing how big of an impact that has on my life. Cause it's like, I don't like public speaking and I'm nervous as hell. And like, I don't particularly want to share and all this stuff. And then one person comes up and they look me in the eyes and say, man, thank you so much for doing that. Like, it's unbelievable. And it's just like, okay, this is all worthwhile. Here's my boulder here. I'm pushing it up the mountain. Everything is just, it just came to go away. And that's kind of, to me, it's re- reassuring that the message is being heard and that it's actually helping somebody. And so, as I said, I, I don't care to share because I don't want sympathy, but it's not being re- perceived as that. I guess it's, that's my mental struggle. What's the resounding takeaway? Like, what's the thing you hear the most often? Like I hear, hey, your beard is bigger than on the internet. Sure. I didn't expect your beard to be so big. Yeah. I hope that had an impactful, you know, footprint on your life. Yeah. My shorts are just short. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. about as deep as I get with people. <laughs> it's but mostly like, just like, holy fuck. Like, is that, that's been your life? It's like, yeah. But then I get this whole, it was, must've been so hard, but it's not that hard. It's been great. You know, I don't know. I, I love what I do. I've been lifting weights. I've met a lot of awesome people, you guys included. You know, I'm doing awesome shit. I played in metal bands over the years. Yeah. I had a blast. So I've had a great life and I know a lot of people who haven't. So I just, I don't, I don't know how to change that perception or how to convey my message more clearly to try and shift that still. So people compare it to mine for some reason. But is it action steps? Like when you, when you talk, is it, is there a call to action or is it just people kind of like, it's, it's almost like, because it's almost like an interpretation, right? Like, yeah, it's like you very look cathartic at a, in a way. Yeah, well, it's like you look at like a piece, like if you ever go to like an art gallery and like you look at something and it's like, there's a lot of, like, there's different interpretations. Like mm-hmm. I think of it like a, like a, the ink plot, the yeah. ink plot test. Mm-hmm. Like that's when I look at your life, I look at right. that. And that's what like the personality test where like, oh, the thing looks like a bat. It's like, well, to some people it might look like their father chasing it with a hammer into a closet. It's like, yeah. hmm, wonder if that has anything to do with your experiences, right? It's like the Warshaw inkblot ink test or whatever. Yeah. Right. Now, do you do you try to guide people to a call to action? Or do you say, hey, here, I'm Bill. Uh, this was my eighth birthday. Blow out the candles. Ha ha, you can't because you have a triple bypass. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so initially, that's kind of what I did. I just, I didn't have a real game plan. I just got up and started telling my story and then took questions and kind of had a conversation that way. And then my last one, I did, I had some takeaway points that I honestly can't remember off the top of my head. I should have written them down here but I kind of, well, yeah, I like to suggest or going forward I want to continue suggesting just at least some bullet points of what is it that I was actually trying to convey today so that there's a little bit of, you can still look at the ink blot and tell me whatever the fuck you think because that's ideally what I would rather but um, I think some people are overwhelmed which is something that I, I didn't really consider when you hear this large amount of information in a 25 minute span you can't really comprehend all the same information at the speed that I'm giving it to you, right? So I didn't consider that in my preparation the first couple times. So then I'm like, okay, well, I need to break this down and try to simplify at least at the end. So it's like one, two, three. I can I can count. Bill's gonna send pre course material. Pre course material. Be a medical textbook. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. all right, here's everything you know you need to know about the tricuspid vibes, valve <laughs> yeah. of the heart. Read yeah. chapters thirteen through seventy two, and we'll reconvene next week for a half yeah. hour talk. Shake yeah. my hand. See you later. Here's all the points. consonants in the alphabet. <laughs> um, I guess like I have a question for you. Like this is probably pretty cathartic for you. Like every time that like you say your story, like you probably feel. I don't know. Do you feel better? I don't want to assume. Like, does it make it make more sense? Uh. 
No, I would say like for my my own perception of my life, it hasn't really changed at all. It doesn't feel like a heavy load to carry. Yeah. Because it's just the load I've always carried. Um but it's like I said, it's those thank yous that really does just makes me it gives me motivation to continue to think, okay, I'm doing something that may make leave an impact on at least some people. So I'm going to continue to pursue this. Some some people would say like uh, philanthropy is the consequence of selfish pursuits. Sure. So like people do only good things to make themselves feel better, yeah. right? Like if you looked at it mm-hmm. as realistically as possible, and it's not to say that you're a selfish person, but yeah. like did you start this as like a selfish pursuit and now you're receiving like these like thank yous from people? Like did it turn into something maybe more selfless over time or? Initially, it was absolutely a bit of both. Well, to, to rewind, I guess, I started training at a gym in my hometown at Teeswater after my heart surgery. So it was a couple months later, I was semi-recovered. But I wanted to start helping people. So as you mentioned, you know, people come to that realization. But it was mostly because the light bulb moments I was able to share with those people lifting weights. It's like, as you guys do, when you give someone information on how to do an exercise more effectively, you're like, holy fuck, I've been doing this wrong this, this long. Is this easy? And But to share that moment with so many people, that's fulfilling to me. So I was like, I need to find fulfillment for myself because I don't have anything. Okay. Like, I don't have yeah. a daily sense of joy or Fair fulfillment. Enough. So those are things I want. So I, did, I started off to pursue that. I think, okay, if I can get these thank yous after my talks, that makes me feel good. Yeah. And therefore, I feel better and I can You're more continue. motivated right. to continue. So... Yeah, I think that's an important point, right? Like, I think we look at people, like, not just like Bill, but like other people who do things that seem enormously selfless, but we ignore the fact that most things we do are for a selfish reason, right? Mm-hmm. Like, people give to charity because it feels good. You wouldn't give to charity if you had no feeling about it. You'd probably just walk by. Yeah, but sure. at the end of the day, if the end result's the same and you're helping people, it oh, doesn't matter. No, but no, a hundred percent. I think yeah. the perspective for me is like, oh, you know, we can talk about, yeah, hey, you've been doing a hamstring curl. There was some bystander in the course this weekend who's like i've been working out wrong my whole life yeah <laughs> and then it's like well imagine that like yeah that's cool like it's like what we kind of dig on but imagine not going hey uh you like you've been doing this hamstring curl wrong like hey you've been living your life wrong like the entire <laughs> oh time. yeah it's totally you've been different. doing this you've been going about this all the wrong way right i think that has a little bit more profound of an and that's one thing that we try and reiterate it's like look at the end of the day like it's reps and sets here like yeah there's people like you that are actually you know because that's impactful like you were telling me about how old was that lady at the at the talk? I think she's 73, 74. Yeah. So she's she's got some miles. Yeah, she's lived definitely lived a life and she's from my hometown as well, so I know a little bit about it, but she approached me after my my talk in Teeswater and she said that was like a religious experience for me. So thank you for sharing. And she had tears in her eyes. And to me that was a huge eye opener that like I didn't realize that I would ever have that kind of effect on someone. Yeah, no, like yeah, I, I don't have I, that dude, effect I, on I, I, anyone. I made, I made a guy like you know I, I fixed a deadlift, instant PR, no tears. Yeah, was, <laughs> and he guess what? His deadlift yeah. wasn't that strong to begin with because yeah. he hasn't been doing it for seventy three years. Sure. So it's like it's, you know magnitude of like the impact, right? Mm-hmm. What's your biggest? I mean, I struggle with this. I'm better than I used to be. Like even stuff like this. Like I used to be kind of like jittery and stuttery, even more so than I am. But like I was given a piece of advice very early in my career, and it was to get out of your own way. Yeah. Now it's like I find in my experience the people worth listening to are the people that don't want to talk. It's like if I'm in a room and there's a guy sitting there, not saying shit, listening to whatever he's listening to, <laughs> like half to, that's the guy I want to sit next to because he's got something to say. Sure. He's just too humble and pride, proud to say it. Right. Right. With you and like with what you do, what's what's been the best tool to get out of your own way? Honestly, people like you. Okay, it has to be a better answer than that. So I, that, you're, you're not, you're not, you haven't given me a wrong answer yet, but like, no, honestly, like what's, yeah. Like who, like not me, but like who would be an example of that? Well, I guess my dad. Yeah. Classic example, but he's been my hero my whole life. I've He drove me to the hospital every time I needed to go because my mom doesn't drive in the city. And so I spent a lot of time with my dad as a kid. And even to this day, like he had cancer seven, eight years ago. You so, know, that's, I, so that's mid-divorce? <laughs> like when, is yeah. that, when does that layer <laughs> in to uh, this fucking... 
I would no, that was around twenty five. So it was it was a few years ago now, but uh, even in, at that time, he's in the hospital. He's walking around the unit. They said, you know, you're not bedridden, so he walked around. And they're on the drugs that they're on or whatever, so he wasn't sleeping and stuff. But he's walking around the unit. He's like he was the only guy on the whole fucking unit who wasn't just laying in bed, like I'm gonna die. Dad's like, oh, I got a fifteen percent chance to live. All right, I'm gonna walk around. So that's like the mindset I've just been ingrained that's been ingrained my whole life and even to this day like he's he works a full-time job he's doing salmon aquariums in public schools all across the side of the province it's like it's a it's a program with the mnr and bruce power like he's go 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 he's also up for nomination for having the most canadian job, job of ever. All time. yeah that's amazing like no openings at the plaid factory but hey <laughs> hey hey uh and Mr. Muscle Bill, do you think you can install salmon aquariums in public school? Yeah, no, he's, he does it for the class projects and the kids do like science projects on it. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. Does he still get nervous? Me? Yeah. Like when you go up and talk, you still oh, get yeah. nervous. Oh, yeah. I'm jittery. Absolutely. I, I wouldn't even notice you were jittery, but I, I feel like I stutter and my heart's pumping like crazy. Has it gotten easier? Yeah. It's been easier than the first time for sure. But the first five ish minutes is always a little bit, I find myself going, um, and then I kick my own ass. I'm like, stop saying that fucking um word. Like, you know what you're going to say. So just continue on. But honestly, my heart being audible now is sort of a conscious thing that like, holy shit, my heart's pumping. This whole room can hear my heart pumping. So they know that my heart's racing, but they can't. But in my mind, it's a distraction for me too. You know what you should do to fuck yourself is put the lapel mic right over the left side I, of the chest. I did that. <laughs> It's like the beginning of <laughs> Renegade by Styx. It's yeah. just like the the the, the heartbeat. Yeah. The the clip I sent to you, that's where the mic was, was yeah. right here. And when I listened afterwards, I'm like, fuck. Do, do, do. <laughs> now moving forward, what's the game plan? So I'm working on that. I've had a hard time, as I've realized in the last couple of years, long-term goal setting. Because as I realized, I kind of worry about current state of affairs <laughs> as opposed as, to as one would. Term. Yeah. yeah. And so I think I talked to you when you were down for the podcast about yeah. I'm very good at reverse engineering from a big thing into smaller things and action items and all that. I have a hard time imagining a big thing. So where can I go? What can I do? What's a good or semi-realistic or whatever kind of goal you want to set? I don't know. I just I want to talk in front of more people. I want to share my story with more people. And I'd like to ultimately just try to help as many people as possible. So as people talk about impact and whatever kind of words or fucking buzzwords right now, I don't know, but I live in a town of a thousand people. So my exposure to the, I don't know, current affairs isn't exactly up to date. Yeah. yeah one so more check, talk. check bill out on my space. I used to download on my wire, <laughs> but so yeah, I, I would like to just go further, do more, get in front of more people, practice speaking, as much as possible and i don't know now you still live in teeswater currently yeah yep could you would you leave <laughs> yeah so that's something else i've been thinking about too as i said my health care has always been centered around london uh, ontario so i'm kind of limited in that radius or within radius of a hospital that can treat me so again it's been a limitation that's been kind of it's like living my life in a bowl of southwestern ontario so I haven't really imagined trying to project out of that. So would I move? Absolutely. It would it be complicated potentially, but uh, I haven't really thought that far ahead. I don't know where I would go. You know. Now, how much of like I mean, because that's an interesting part of Ontario. Like I've lived in Ontario almost my whole life, and it's like Teeswater. You had to give me a few points of reference. We're like, okay, I know like the ballpark general area I would have to drive to hopefully get lost and run into Teeswater. Yeah, absolutely. But like. You know, me and me and him here, like we're both from Windsor and albeit like a shitty town with a ton of disadvantages. Like, I think we're both pretty grateful we grew up there. Like, 100%. I, I could identify pretty much every illegal street drug yep. just by looking at it. Sure. Like, I don't need to test it. I could tell when a guy's strung out on something. I could tell you what it is. I could tell you when he probably took it. And it's like that finds you pretty well in certain situations. Like, how much has grown growing up in a town like Teeswater kind of helped in your approach to all this? I think it was paramount, honestly. Every time I would get released from hospital, I go home. Teeswater's small, it's quiet, it's safe. There isn't 
I don't know about now, but there's not really drug use. It's not a dangerous place. You can walk around day and night, 24 <laughs> seven. Yeah. You know, but coming home, it was always a safe place. And I think that's why I was able to recover and really kind of reset myself and just think like, yeah, okay, I'm back out. I'm back this, I'm going to school again and life is good. But if I was in the, like, uh, in the ghetto in Windsor, maybe, you know, okay. shout, shout out, out. Windsor. Yeah. yeah. That's right. I don't know that I would have had the same sense of safety at home, but I had a lot of chaos, obviously, in my childhood and over my life in the medical sense. But my, we'll call it personal life, has always been great, you know. So I've had great friends. I've, like I said, my family has always supported me and everything I've always done. So I don't know that would have been the same in the city. A shift work is always different, I find, like double income households. Sometimes the parents aren't home and all that kind of stuff, but... I've always been really fortunate. So, so I mean, when you're in the hospital and you're in there for weeks on end and you don't have the ability to escape to that safe place, mm-hmm. where do you go? <laughs> Usually I flirt with the nurses. Hey, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever <laughs> helps, man. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, so this is a story I've told a few times, but when I was in the ICU last summer, I was in the only room that had a window and I was the only guy conscious in the ICU. So what are the chances of that, first of all? But I was on oxygen and in rough shape and all that. But I woke up in the morning and the sun came right in my window. So I get out of bed. I'd piss into my urinal, looking out the window. And I'd be like, oh, here's the sun hanging on the urinal, right? And I sit down and I'd eat breakfast with the sun on my back. I'd drink my cold tea because they were always taking fucking blood work right when breakfast comes. But anyways, and I just, I just sat there and I just, I remember feeling so grateful that I could experience the sunshine. And I'm just, I'm in this ICU, the guy, literally the guy across the hall from me was flatlined 10, 20 times a day. And so the nurses are down there and they're running or whatever. And I'm sitting there just drinking my tea, walking around with my IV pole, with my ass out, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> as one does. Yeah. And it, it's frustrating for sure when you're stuck in a bed. But as I said, I just kind of tell myself, well, if today I can't get on a bed, then I know I'm getting out of bed tomorrow. Because 20 other times I've got out of bed tomorrow if it wasn't today. So I just have a confidence that things will get better. And so I don't really get down on myself too much. But I found myself also literally verbalizing cues. So like when I couldn't breathe, I recorded myself on my cell phone and just said, everything's going to be okay. We got this. Keep breathing. You're okay. And then I got tired of talking, so I just hit play to myself over and over again because I was like, okay, this is fucking shitty, but I can just listen to this. And then I just fell asleep. Yeah, so to be said about, and this is, uh, we all know Paul O'Neill, it's something he talks yeah. about a lot, is like the idea of like positive self talk. Sure. And like the impact that can have. And like there's pretty good science behind like the physiological behind the psychological, like the psychological mm-hmm. phenomenon being the self talk, but like the actual cognitive and physiological benefits that has when now you're on the other side like Mm -hmm. you're outside i mean you can piss in a jug if you want you have that freedom there's plenty of your sun can shine wherever it wants to you can still walk with your ass hanging out but there's no consequence in the regular world though right i think there's some rules in florida (laughs) is if you leave your house naked you're fine but if you get Get naked naked outside outside, (laughs) big no-no i didn't know that last week at a hybrid (laughs) yeah this is information that could have helped you yeah but do you find yourself now looking back and drawing on the shitty times to give you perspective? Absolutely. Yeah. Because a lot of times I find I have trouble with uh, energy or motivation to do things now. Because I don't know. I, I haven't really figured out if it's some sort of slight of depression or if it's just physiological things happening. But then I remember what was I trying to tell myself at some of those hard times? And what was I looking forward to? So why am I not doing that now? Because there's nothing stopping me. You know, I'm, I don't want to say I think of myself as an unstoppable force because obviously I know that that's not the case, but there's nothing in my way. You know, my health kind of is arguably, but at the same time, it's not. I'm on antibiotics. I go to London once a week. These are facts of life to keep me alive. So they're not really problems. They're just my life. So how can I factor in the things that I want to do? And just arrange it around the things that I have to do. Now, like for most people listening, like they're listening on an iPhone. I know this because I can track our metric. 
Is there an existential takeaway that you can actually give to someone who has the luxury to be conscious, not in an ICU, with an iPhone? Is there anything you can even say or do you just let them interpret it themselves? I wish it was better with words. I So this is where I admire Killian and, and yourself even, but the philosophical side of things, I don't read books. I'm not shy to say that. I'm not proud of that, but I'm not a book met, guy. You've met God. I've only yeah. read about him <laughs> yeah. in a book. I heard him reference one. So. You know, but I wish I had more insightful terminology or like sick quotes to you know share with people, but I don't. It's just I, I hand out cards at my talks and I, I hand write them and I just say, you're doing great or keep going. You're doing great. So and I hand them out to everybody that comes and it's like I carry them around. And if you need a reminder, just look at it. You know, it's simple. I'm a very uh, simple processing type person. I'm logical and analytical a lot of the time. And I find that just that simple short reminder can go a long way. So that's that's been the message I've been trying to push is just just keep going. Better guy than me, man. You're doing great. Yeah, there's a sophistication to that, right? Yeah. Like the simplicity of it. Like I don't need to know that you read Nietzsche. Sure. Just fucking keep going. Muscle yeah. Bill, 2020. Yeah. It's far more sophisticated than anything I'll quote. Right. Or misquote. I'll never know if it's quoted or misquoted, though, either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's crazy, man. It's just yeah. like, it's weird to hear, like, that side of things, right? Like, what do you follow up that with? You, There's nothing. Yeah, like, I mean, me, absolutely. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's good. Like, I think it's perspective, right? Like, I spend the majority of my time reading about World War II. Mm-hmm. Because it's like that to me is probably the worst thing ever. Yeah. Like I could find a picture. I wouldn't disagree. And but but that's the thing. It's like unless you have exposure to that, like some people will listen to what you're saying and that'll be the worst thing ever. Sure. Like the thought process of having to do that to being ankle braceleted to a hospital. Like I literally have this. I have this quote from this book. It's like it's a, it's a book called it's by Primo Levi. It's uh, if this is a man. So when, and it's okay. people like wrote this after he got out of Auschwitz for 11 months in an internment camp in between 1942 and 1943. I keep this and it's like the last page of one of the chapters is called a good day. Mm-hmm. He wrote a chapter called a good day about his a day in the work camps in, sure. in, in Poland for a few hours. We can be unhappy in the manner of free men. Yeah. So they had like, they got spoiled cabbage soup that allowed them to not be starving. And for a few hours, they could be unhappy. Like, it's like, that's perspective. And I have to read morose shit like that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, or I could just talk to you. (laughs) And he's like, well, my eighth birthday party, I was drinking out of my neighbor's garden hose and running through the sprinkler on the front lawn. So what's the quote? Keep going. You're doing great. Muscle Bill. At Muscle Bill on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. In the DM. Thanks for your time, man. Yeah. I pre- no man this is the honor for me to come out 